Okay. Okay, so let's talk about neurofeedback as we age. Neurofeedback helps promote self-regulation, which helps all of us as we get older and tend to get dysregulated with sleep and mood and so forth. So doing neurofeedback helps us stay strong and regulated, and that can make a huge difference in the quality of life. And even when there's something specific like a dementia occurring, we can even in that case make a big difference. And, and not just preventing decline, but actually improving people's quality of life. So it's really quite striking how helpful it can be. So people, for instance, recover their sense of humor. They, um, they start to be more with it and more responsive and able to engage in conversation instead of you know, losing their place and so forth. So it's the kind of thing you, you try and, and most times you're surprised, like, wow, this really has a good effect. And then, of course, then you're motivated to keep going and, and you just see, you see what's, what's possible. In terms of doing it, um, you know, the, from the clinician's perspective, it's not just what do we do, say, for dementia, but how do we help this person. So it, it, it has everything to do with who is the person who has the dementia. So is this a person who is vulnerable to headaches and, and panic attacks and sort of out of control explosive events like that? Then we would start with the appropriate training like T3, T4 for, for those uh, symptoms. If, if you have a person who's more like anxious and has difficulty sleeping and maybe has early trauma life experience, then we're gonna start on the right side to calm them down. But ultimately, the expectation is we sort of going to gravitate to all of the major sites, the high-level processing sites, so the parietal and the temporal areas to help with uh, sensory processing, and then the prefrontal cortex to help with organization and attention and, and, and so forth. So there's nothing really different about dealing with dementia except just do everything and keep going. And sometimes, sometimes you have to kind of, you, you don't get over doing the, the feedback. Maybe you have to maintain some level of feedback to maintain those gains as, we, as we're aging or as we have a dementia. And that's, and that's fine if that continues to your quality of life. It's better than taking medication, right? Mm -hmm. um, but uh, so, so I think a, as we've gotten better, as this technique's gotten stronger, we're able to do a more profound shift more quickly and it holds better. But don't be surprised if you need to sort of keep it going at some level. Okay. What are some examples of people where you found you've seen a um, you've seen a major dif uh, change? Wow. Okay. Um, well, you know, going way back, my my dad, my own father, <clears throat> had a, a dementia. He was a very sort of intellectual guy, and he'd get to the point where he would stop talking because he would get lost in the paragraph, and so he just sort of withdrew and stopped talking. And this was, this was kind of early on in terms of the evolution of the neurofeedback, but it was profoundly helpful right from the beginning. He, he started to talk again. He, he started to argue. My mom said, oh, you've, he's arguing with me again. You've given me my husband back. <laughs> and and we, we kept that up. He was living up in Montana. We were down here in California. He'd come down, train for a while, go back. And then eventually we got a system into his home, and a neighbor would come over who was, you know, a, health practitioner would come over and hook him up every day and do sessions. And that, you know, eventually it's going to get you, but if you can have that curve be up here instead of down here, that's, that's very much worth doing. So you find not only mitigating effects, um, but also um, improving, as in yes. turning, turning time back, essentially. You see that with uh, Parkinson's. And um, my, my mom, on the other hand, she, she also benefited from neurofeedback, too. She had been very healthy all of her life. Um, toward the end, she was quite ill, and the um, body was stressed by being extremely ill, and she started to have panic attacks. And so we got a She was living in Montana also. We got a system there. She would actually hook herself up. She had it. She hated the idea of computers and all that kind of stuff. Wouldn't have a computer. She had two computers sitting in her house on which she did the Nerfie back. And she would put the electrodes on herself and hook herself up and do that every day. And it kept her um, 
more functional. Uh, it's funny because she'd go to the doctor and they'd say, well, what pills do you take? You know, what medicines do you take? And she said, none. And they didn't believe her. They'd ask her three or four or five times <laughs> what pills she was taking. They didn't believe she was taking no medicine. Because in this country, you get older, you, you get something for your blood pressure and your cholesterol and your sleep and your whatever. And she didn't take anything. And she lived to be 95 and was done, you know? She, it, was, it was a peaceful death because um, she didn't suffer then from the anxiety and the sleep problems and so forth. So imagine if we could improve people's quality of those last 10, 20 years of your life, like for everyone's sake, it makes a huge difference. And we're talking daily routine or how frequently would you think? Should we all do this? Um, <clears throat> um, yeah, it's great to do a daily routine. It isn't necessary for most people, but uh, I don't know, like most good things that we don't do as many times as we mean to do. Um, you know, a, lot of people, a, lot of, a lot of us who do neurofeedback professionally, why don't we hook ourselves up and do that? Well, I do, and I for personally, and I benefit from that, and, uh, and a lot of people do. It would be foolish not to. It's part of, I mean, we know that for aging, to, it's, it's amazing how much difference it can make how we live our lives. So we know that uh, social support is tremendously important. Physical exercise is important. Uh, you know, diet is incredibly important. Sunlight is important. Right? We we know these things. And if you take if you do those things and then you drop neurofeedback into it, it's going to be like ten times more effective. So it's all worth doing. Okay. Uh, sleep issues. Um, a lot of people find that they have light sleep, or and that's something surface, even though they're fully functional during the day. Right. There's sort of a myth that oh, you're older, of course you have problems sleep. Of course you don't sleep well. And it's true. You're older. You've lived longer. More bad things can happen. You could be more dysregulated. But there's nothing that says you can't sleep well as an older person. But that's the part of the slippery slope. You're not sleeping well, so I'm not rested in the morning. So my my body hasn't recovered, and you know it could lead to then mood problems and blah 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 and if you keep yeah keep doing your nerve feedback you're going to sleep well and that's going to make a huge difference so the the anxious people who have difficulty falling asleep the people who are you know have interrupted sleep and don't get enough deep sleep to be rested in the morning there lots of ways that that can be messed up and it's all it's all a soft problem it's all a functional problem which is what nerve feedback's about we don't have to put chemicals in, we don't have to, you know, take things out, just get it to be more balanced, works better. Um, for the golfers, have you um, had any... Actually, <laughs> golf, yes, interestingly, golf is such a mental game. First of all, neurofeedback is being used now with um, Olympic sports teams, with professional sports teams, it's starting to get in there, and what happens is they tend not to talk about it because in the beginning it's an advantage, right? And you don't want your, your opponents to have the same thing. Um, but over the years I've worked a number of times with golfers. Cause it, it's, it's just you and the ball, right? And, uh, and so it's a very mental game, and you might be distractible. You might uh, think of the g golfers who are great, but then if they make a mistake, then they're blown. They can't emotionally recover for the next rest of the round. There are lots of ways that that, that can go south. I mean, there are a, an enormous number of extremely well, um, you know, athletic and skilled golfers. So who wins the, the conference? Who, who wins the round? It's, it's really a mental game. And so, yeah, so people who are serious about golf, do it. You, you, know, you can track your golf score as a, as a measure of, of the outcome of the training. Is this something where you do the training just before the game, or how, how does it work into your routine? No, not so much. Uh, I mean, sure, one can say, look, I've got a big game tomorrow, and I want to make sure I have a really good sleep tonight, and I'm not worrying too much. I'll just, you know, do some alpha theta or do some calming info low. But mostly it's, it's a... You're just maintaining that physiological regulation, and so it's not so much tied to the actual time. Um, alcohol. Um, I mean, you know, people drink, you know, half a bottle a day is quite sort of normal in sort of southern environments, especially when, when one's retired. Sure. Um, but but some people don't want to admit or only find out that when they fall over in the bathroom and they can't get up themselves, that you know it would yeah. be helpful if they 
could cut that down a bit, but um, what's, the, what's the sort of approach to how would you... Well, it's really interesting. You don't have to intend to change your alcohol consumption. You just do the self-regulation training, and then people notice, oh, this is weird. Now, I'm after I have that first glass of wine, I actually don't want another glass. That's so weird, right? Um, so it's it's your, your physiology shifts, and then you consciously you go, oh, wow, okay, this is different. So uh, I don't... I, it's an, some people have different sensitivities. For most of us, having a cup of coffee, having a glass of red wine, I don't see that as some really terrible thing. But as you say, if people that turns into four or five glasses, that can start to compromise things. So w what you expect is, as I say, you don't have to have the intention of doing less. You just have the intention of getting, <clears throat> improving <clears throat> your self-regulation, and then a lot of things fall away. People forget to smoke cigarettes. They, they, they forget to, to drink more wine, to have a, have a second cup of coffee. It's, uh, it's kind of makes it fun. Um, and maybe just a um, quick rundown on what it is and or what it isn't. Um, so it's a, it's yeah. a non-invasive technique um, and uh, it's half hour sessions, um, it's extremely mobile. Mm -hmm. um, how would you um, characterize what this does to your brain? <clears throat> right. Right. Intrigued by electrodes, for example. So this right. is yeah, the cool thing about neurofeedback is that it is not invasive. All we're doing is measuring your brain waves. So we put uh, some little sensors on the head that pick up the brain waves. So, but nothing goes in. So it's not invasive. It's not pushing your brain around. We're not even judging what's good and bad. We're just taking those brain waves, extracting some particular information from the brain waves, and actually showing that back to the brain. So the the games, the movies, and so forth are are incorporating the the vari training variable in in the display. So if you're watching the movie, your brain is getting it. You don't have to try, you just have to watch it. And it's it's a lot, I think a lot like meditation, that simply by focusing internally, you're allowing things to calm and settle and regulate. It's surprisingly strong and specific in its in effect, but I think at core it's just promoting self-regulation by allowing this sort of internal awareness. And the problem is we don't have sensors for our brain waves, right? I can't, you can't be aware of your brain waves directly, but with very simple instrumentation, with simple computers, we can measure the brain waves, filter them, show them back to the brain, and the, and the brain's got the information, and the brain wants it, it likes to see itself, it grabs that information and uses it, and we get very strong effects. It's quite surprising. So we can see this as a um, as a substitute for meditation. Um, <clears throat> so how does neurofeedback relate to meditation? We, it, it's a similar path. There's certainly uh, values in neurofeedback, about specific values in meditation as well. A lot of people have trouble with meditation because their brains jump around too much, and so they can't really get the value from meditation. Uh, neurofeedback, we don't have that problem. It's like here it is, bam, you can you can see it. So a lot of people find that after they do neurofeedback, then they can meditate, which has its own value, as I say. So it, they don't conflict, or you know, they're both of value. Great. Okay.